Good morning. I want you to look at the person next to you right now and just tell them, say, you're at the right place at the right time. I'm so glad you guys are here today. Uh, my name's Brian, and uh, I'm one of the pastors here at Cross Point. And I just want to start off by uh, just saying thank you to Dallas and, and Paul and Mark and Tracy and our team for just leading us in worship today. Man, we appreciate them. Eddie and Jessica are up in the mountains, so you can pray for them right now, that they don't get snowed in there. That's what happened last time they went up there. They got, we got stuck up there, but uh, it's good to have our team that's here today. And uh, it's kind of cool. Dallas, I like how you uh, brought Paul out from behind the, uh, the, the drum shield thing that we had right here. Growing up at my church, we didn't have drums. Some of you don't understand this, but some of you will understand this. They didn't have drums uh, in church because they were too loud, and uh, people just didn't like loud drums, I guess, in church. Uh, and then in the early days of bringing the drums in, they brought them in, but then they put this shield in right here. And what this shield really is, is it's, it's more like a bulletproof glass case is what it is, all right? So that people don't, like, shoot you, okay, as the drummer in the church. Uh, but uh, we love drummers, right, Neil? And uh, Sal, all right, and others as well. And yeah, you even get some claps, all right, love it. But uh, we are, uh, we're really, really excited about our worship, what God's done here. Welcome. Last weekend, we had an incredible service uh, at the Nixon Library, our special Christmas service there, and had uh, right at about 1,800 people that were there uh, last weekend and three services. And church, I just to tell you how proud I am of you. You guys did such an amazing job of welcoming people all the way from the street to the seat. And you guys showed love, uh, man, your hospitality uh, from the parking team to the kids ministry team to refreshment center. Some of you guys, you got up, uh, actually some of you stayed up all night, okay? Uh, you, you loaded everything late at night, had a whole team go over there. Uh, then we had a, a whole nother team that actually stayed up all night long. Uh, over there setting everything up getting everything prepped and we had a whole nother team uh, that came after it was over and loaded everything from there back over here and uh, had our worship team and just great great job i'm just so proud of our church and how god is using you i've met so many of you uh, as well that were at that service last week that are here this week welcome back glad we didn't scare you off okay after your first visit uh, so glad you guys are here at our main campus here at uh, here at cross point we got some new lights as well i don't know if you guys noticed but excited about our, our some new lights that we got in uh still got a few more things we've got to kind of get prepared but i want to say a special thank you to uh to doug and and just his team uh he and his his team actually uh they're electricians own a uh, elect, uh a whole lecture they came in they donated all their time and it just made everything happen. So, man, thank you, Doug, man. We really appreciate you. And your team and, and just your ministry. Uh, we, today, I want to talk to you about uh, what God taught me in 2015. And I just want to take kind of a one message shot and talk to you. I, just, I want to give you just a little sneak peek into the last week of the year for me every year and I actually did it a week early because I knew I was going to do this message this year uh, so I did it this past week and but this is normally that season between after Christmas and the new year how many have a little extra time off just raise your hand if you have a little bit of extra time off uh, I usually take this season and this time to do what I call wrapping up 2015 and then ramping up to 2016. I have a, a whole list of questions that I kind of ask myself that I go through and I evaluate. And so I want to talk to you about my process of what I do. And maybe uh, it'd be an encouragement to you. Maybe for some of you, you may get a couple tips and ideas of uh, how you can spend some time, how you can continue to become the person that God has called you to be, how you can reach your full redemptive potential in Jesus Christ. And so I want to talk to you about why I think it's important to wrap up a year first. The reason why I think it's important is because life is peaks and valleys. And I think it's important to capture these things. I think it's important to, to write them down, to, to remember these things. Did you know that God's people in the Old Testament were the Israelites? And the Israelites, they spent certain seasons of time where they were really close to God. And then they spent other seasons of time where they were distant from God. And in one of those times when they were distant, uh, they went to Samuel, who was like the judge, and he was the prophet. And, and uh, they just said, we feel like God's abandoned us. 
And so we feel like God isn't near. You ever felt like that? That that God is so far away and God, where are you at right now? And and they had this enemy and their enemy was the Philistines. It was Israel versus the Philistines. And it kind of reminds me kind of like this this epic battle between both Israelites and and the Philistines. Uh, uh, How many of you have seen the movie Creed? Anybody seen the movie Creed? I I watched the movie Creed. Man, how many of you seen the movie Star Wars, all right? Oh, there they are. I'm part of the 1% that haven't seen any of the Star Wars. Uh, I know, what, really? Uh, I don't know, maybe that's what I should do this week, all right? Just watch Star Wars episodes. Take me all week long to watch those. But in this movie, Creed, what I love about this movie is it's kind of the old Rocky movies, and, and they bring it back, and, and what you have is you've got this, this guy, Creed, uh, who's Apollo Creed's son. Uh, Rocky Balboa is now his, his trainer, and he's going up against Pretty Ricky. And this guy, Ricky, is like no match for Creed. And it's like, is he going to be able to beat him? And is he going to be able to take him out? That's kind of like what you have with the Israelites and the Philistines. But Israelite felt like God had abandoned him because the Philistines, they just kept knocking him out, knocking him out, knocking him out. Win after win after win after win to where the Israelites just felt defeated. So they go to Samuel and Samuel says, listen, you want to know the reason why God is so distant? He said, it's because he's lost priority in your life. He's like, he used to be number one in your life, but now all of a sudden, you know, you've got all these other gods ahead of you. You have all these other things that are way more important to you than God is. And he says, remember the Ark of the Covenant? See, in the Old Testament, God had the Ark of the Covenant, and this is where his presence dwelt. And this was a covenant that God made with his people. Now, in the Old Testament, it was a conditional covenant. And the conditional covenant said this. It said that if you obey me, if you follow my ways, and if you keep me first place in your life, and you keep me as a high priority in your life, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to put my hand of favor upon you. And you're going to see me do some incredible things in your life. And you're going to watch back and say, only God could have done that. He said, but this conditional covenant is also true that if you don't follow me, and if you decide to go your way instead of God's way, He said, then there's going to be some consequences that are going to take place. So remember the Ark of the Covenant. So they would take the Ark of the Covenant and they would carry it with them everywhere that they went. And it was kind of like, you know, God was traveling with them on wheels. It was a very holy thing. So he says, remember the Ark of the Covenant. He's like, listen, we got to take some time just to purify ourselves. He said, if you feel like God's abandoned, let's come back to him. So you can read the story. I think it's 1 Samuel chapter 7. So Samuel says, let's get all the people together. Let's just do a big prayer meeting. So they had this big prayer meeting. They, they had this meeting where they decided they weren't going to eat for a whole day. They fasted for a whole day just so they could concentrate on God. And in the middle of this prayer and fasting time, they get word that the Philistines are coming toward them right then and there. And they're like, man, the Philistines keep knocking us out. Here they are coming again. So they tell Samuel, they're getting ready to go get their swords. And they tell Samuel, Samuel, keep praying. Don't stop praying to God. And so he keeps praying. Next thing you know, here comes the Philistines. They're surrounded But then God steps in, and he confuses all of the Philistines. And after he confuses the Philistines, the Israelites defeat them, and they had this victory. And they look back and said, only God could have done this. So here's what Samuel did. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. It says, then Samuel, he took a a large stone, and he placed it between the towns of Mizpah and Jashna. And he named this stone Ebenezer. Everybody say Ebenezer. Ebenezer. And this Ebenezer means uh, the stone of help. And it said, for up to this point, the Lord has helped us. And so what you'll see in the Old Testament is that they had these stones that were memorial stones. They were stones. They looked back and said, only God could have done that. We need to mark it down. We need to remember it because this stone is going to give us hope for the future. And so what happened is, is they would create these memorial stones. Happened again to Joshua. Some of you may have heard the story before that uh, Moses actually crossed through the Red Sea. And what happened was they were being chased, okay? And as they were being chased, all of a sudden God departed the sea and they walked through on dry ground. Well, that happened 40 years before, but 40 years later, it happened again through Joshua. And what happened was, is they were being chased, Okay, and uh, all of a sudden, they had the Ark of the Covenant with them. And what Joshua said is he said, listen, priest, I want you to step into the water. And as you step into the water, it's going to part just like it did for Moses. And sure enough, that water parted. And as that water parted, they all walked on dry ground together with the Ark of the Covenant. So here's what Joshua said, Joshua chapter 4, verse 7. Then you can tell them, 
They remind us. These stones remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came across. These stones will stand as a what? A memorial among the people of Israel forever. So what God often did is he told Joshua, he said, I want you to find 12 people. They represent the 12 tribes of Israel, and I want you to get 12 stones. I want you to make these memorials. Why? So that when the next generation comes along, they come by and say, what's that stone all about? Say, let me tell you about a time when God showed up in my life. Let me tell you about a moment when God blessed me. Let me show you a moment that was a miracle that we look back and said, only God could have done that. Let me give you a teaching point. Let me show you some hope. See, because if you lose hope, you lose everything. So God says, remember these moments. So that's what I do to wrap up my year. What I do is I go back and I look at my, my stones. And I go back and say, what are the memories in 2015? What is it, God, that you have taught me this year? What is the things that I want to continue to build upon? Where were the moments I look back and said, only God could have done that? God, where do you want to teach me? Where do you want to grow me? Now, I read this book uh, three years ago called uh, Too Busy Not to Pray by Bill Hybels. And as I was, what a great title, right? Too Busy Not to Pray. So busy, I got to pray. What a great title. As I'm reading through this book, Bill Hybels, who's, who's a pastor of a very large church, uh, he, was, he was describing me. You ever read through a book, you're like, that's me. This is me. And he was talking about his RPMs running so high that he has a lot to do. And he's going from here to there to here to there. And his to-do list is forever long. And, and then he started explaining his times with God. And Bill Hybels said when he'd wake up in the morning, he'd start spending time with God. But his mind was just flooding with thoughts. Has that ever happened to you? It's like you're reading, all of a sudden something else distracts you. You think, oh yeah, I got to go to the store today. Oh yeah, got to have this conversation today. And so Bill Hybels, in his book, Too Busy Not to Pray, he said, let me tell you how I lower my RPMs of how this works. So I took his advice. I've been doing this now for three years. So, so I started it three years ago. Here it is. It's journaling. Now some of you are like, what are you, a girl? You got a diary? You journal. Now I, I tried journaling before. I, I, I just couldn't keep up with it. I didn't know how to do it. And it's like, okay, one day I can write my thoughts, another day I can't write my thoughts. And, and then what I learned from this book, Too Busy Not to Pray, is I learned one word, and this one word changed my whole journaling effort. It's like, I knew, okay, it's like, okay, I know how to journal now. I got it down. I, my mind knows exactly what to write every single day with this one word. So much so, I counted my journal entries this last week. I did 241 journal entries last year, okay? So I tried to, not every day, but I did a lot, okay? So last year was probably my best. And here's, here's the one word. Keep me, learn, teach me how to journal. Here it is, you ready? Yesterday. Yesterday, that was it. So it's like whenever I sat down this morning and I do it on my iPad, I just typed out yesterday and I just walk through what happened yesterday. And sometimes I write two sentences, sometimes I write two paragraphs. And my journal is filled with my good days and it's filled with my bad days. It's filled with some of my best and some of my worst. So what I do during this season, I actually did it this last week, as I read through every single one of my journal entries this past year. And guess what I found? I found a lot of stones, and I found some memories, and I found some times where I was like, only God could have done that. I found things that be able to give me hope. I found some things that was like, I've got to do better at that. That's bad. That is a repeated thing that I keep doing over and over and over and over again. So, some people say this. They say, experience is the best teacher. I totally disagree with that. Because some people have 20 years of experience, but they don't really have 20 years of experience. What they have is they have one year of experience, but they've done that 20 times, year after year after year. See, they don't have 20 years of experience. They've been doing the same thing over and over and over and over. Here's what I believe is the best thing, not experience. It's evaluated experience. It's to evaluate it. It's how do we relentlessly improve? How do we continue to get better? And the only way you do that is through evaluation. That's why God said, I want you to mark it down. I want you to have a memorial. I want you to learn from this moment. I don't want you to forget it. This is a lesson that I want you to ingrain in your mind. And so this is what I want you to do. You may not have a journal. Maybe some of you may be challenged to be able to uh, do a journal this next year. If so, I believe you'll love it because here's what it does. It lowers my RPMs 
and it allows me to be able to focus on my time with God once I get that stuff kind of out of my brain. It helps in so many areas of my life. Understand this. Take some time, even if you don't have a journal, this next week, and just write down what happened in 2015. God, what did you teach me? What were some of my best days? What were some of my worst days? What were my life lessons? What, what are your memories that you want to teach me? Now, here's what you're going to find as you begin to write some insight, as you begin to think about this. Your life this past year is, is peaks and it's valleys. It's peaks and it's valleys. Your life is up and it's down. It's up and it's down. And so many times, especially as Christians, you know what we do? We pray these prayers of just wanting things to be constant. We, we, don't, we don't want high, high. We don't want low, low. Let's just let it be constant. Some of you just pray. Just let it be like this. Listen, life doesn't work like that. Life is peaks and it's valleys. And you're praying for this. You know what that is? Flatline. <laughs> That's death. You don't want to pray for that. Because it's through the peaks that we're able to say, go God. Look at what you did. Go God. And it's through the valleys oftentimes that we grow the closest to God. It's the times whenever you realize that you don't have anybody but God. And it's at those moments you realize you don't need anybody but God. It's through the peaks and it's through the valleys. It's through the learning experience. So uh, some of you, 2015, you had some ups. You had some incredible ups. For some of you, you went on a mission trip. Some of you, you, some of you students went on a youth camp. Maybe God spoke to you through, in a hospital bed. Maybe through a word of promise from scripture. Maybe some of you through a prayer moment, man. You just felt God was moving you in your direction. Some of you, God, he ministered to you this past year through a song. Some of you through healing in your life. Some of you, you got a job after a long period of absence. Some of you, you had a child. Or you adopted a child. Or you got a grandchild. Or maybe a great-grandchild. Some of you, you begin to rebuild a dream after a time of loss. And these are moments to remember God is here. Some of you accepted Christ this year. Some of you got baptized this year. Listen, there, these are some amazing things that, that God did. Some of you moved into a house this past year. Maybe a car, got your apartment. Some of you got married. I mean, some amazing things happened this year. Now, I recognize some of you had a tough year as well. Some of you maybe got diagnosed with an illness. Maybe someone you love went through some health complications and challenges. It's been tough. Some of you lost a loved one this past year. And you had an empty seat around the Christmas table. It was a tough week for you. Some of you, you moved and you're just distance. Some of you, you lost a friend. Some of you have some relational challenges. Some of you went through a divorce. Some of you are watching your children make some decisions that are just tearing you apart right now. Some of you are so frustrated with yourself and some of the own decisions that you've made on your own. You're like, why do I keep doing this? I keep saying I'm going to stop, but I keep doing it over and over and over again. Listen, it's good to be able to just think through these experiences. Why? Because these are moments when we get close to God. These are ways that I believe that we can wrap up our year, begin to ramp up for a new year. Let me give you the top three lessons that God taught me in 2015. So these are just... Straight out of my prayer journal. Just fresh, raw stuff from my life. One of the things God taught me in 2015 is that in Jesus, there's peace. In Jesus, there's peace. Now you say, you didn't know that in 2014? Yeah, I knew that. But I didn't know it like I know it now. See, John chapter 16 says this. I've told you all this so that you may have, what's the next word, church? Peace, peace in me. He says, here on this earth, you're going to have many, what? And you're going to have trials and sorrows in this earth. Listen, you're praying for this constant thing. Listen, it, life's peaks and valleys. You're praying for all peaks. That's not going to happen. Because in this world, you're going to have trials and you're going to have sorrows. San Bernardino is going to continue to happen. ISIS is still going to be around next year. Terrorism is not going away. In this world, we're going to have trials and sorrows. Cancer is still going to be here. In this world, we'll have trials and sorrows. But take heart. 
Here's what John says. You don't have to be discouraged. You don't have to be defeated. He says, take heart because I, Jesus, have overcome the world. And if you have Jesus, you can have peace. If you have Jesus, you can have certainty. Even when you don't understand, if you have Jesus, you can be able to get through your circumstance and your situation. You may not know when, you may not know where, you may not know why, you may not know how, but if you know who, you can have peace. See, Jesus plus nothing equals And everything minus Jesus equals nothing. Because in Jesus, there is peace. And for some of you, you need peace more than you need anything else in your life. Let me just tell you my journey of peace. My journey started about four years ago. About four years ago, our church, uh, we went from one service to two services. And uh, we were thinking about starting a third service. And we knew we needed to find a new location. We knew we needed to build. At first, we were going to build here, and then we grew like 200 people in one year, and we were like, okay, we're going to build a worship center and invest that amount of money, and the moment we open the door, we're going to be back in three services again, and we are like, maybe that's not the best option, so we started looking at opportunities. So for four years, our church has been looking for opportunities for our next facility, And we have had four different opportunities. One of them, two months ago, we thought, I thought, was a sure deal. Of everything we had done so far, I was like, this one's it. This one is going to be amazing. And and every time, guess what? We pray over them. We fast over them. And and, uh, I have to tell you, sometimes I haven't communicated as much with the church on, like, all the details of all the things like I did in the early days. Because I feel like the boy who cried wolf sometimes. It's like, you know what, hey, we're going to get it and pray for this, and this is the opportunity. No, that wasn't it. So for four four years now, that has happened, and God just continues to close the door. I've come up, and I've told you many times that, you know what, God just has us in the waiting room. Just in the waiting room. How many of you are like me, and you just don't like waiting rooms? I don't like to wait. And God, he just keeps us in the waiting room. And so, uh, but I have to be honest. There have been seasons over the last four years where I'm like in the waiting room and I'm like, God, I've read all the books in the waiting room, read all these magazines, heard the song over and over and it's driving me crazy. I'm ready. What's next? What's next? And what God is teaching me is he's teaching me to trust and he's teaching us peace. And so what I decided to do this last year, 2015, is I was like, I'm going to take a verse on peace, one a month. So I got 12 of them, and I put them on my iPhone. So every time that I need peace, you know what I do? Every time I start thinking about building, facilities, whatever, I look down at my phone and I read a verse about peace. Because God is teaching me peace. I told the story a few years about a God jar, and one of the guys in our church actually took this example, and he actually changed it. He said, I have a Jesus jar, Pastor Brian. And and here's the story. Here's what he did. Every time that he was worried about something, something he couldn't control, something that there's nothing he could do to change it, he would write it down, and then he would put it on a piece of paper, and he'd put it in his Jesus jar. And every time that he wanted to worry about it, every time he began to think about it, he knew what he had to do is he had to go get the Jesus jar, take the lid off, pull it out of the jar to be able to say, God, you don't have this under control. I want to worry about it, that this is my thing right now. So that he could be able to visually see him worrying and seeing what he was doing. Then whenever he got done worrying, he would fold it back up, put it back in the Jesus jar, say, okay, God, you got it now. Some of you need a Jesus jar. You need something to be able to teach you peace. Here's what God's taught me about peace. I have to delegate and relax. Say, what do you mean? Delegate the outcomes to God. This is when you give him your company. You give him your children. You give him your family. You give him your business. You give him yourself. And you do the next right thing. And then trust him with how things turn out. And you relax in his love and you relax in his peace. And the kind of person you become depends upon the master you serve. Because if your master is yourself and your ego and your image and what people think about you, you will not be a servant leader. You will not be filled with Jesus because it's all about you. 
But if your master is King Jesus, and you believe that he's loving and faithful and trustworthy and all-powerful and all-knowing, then guess what you can do? You can relax in his peace. And you can love people. And you can serve people. And you can relax knowing he's got it. He's got this. And in the big picture, over time, you'll see his hand in what you're doing. And you'll be blessed. And you'll have peace. But church, let me tell you something. It's easier to do something for God than to wait for God to do something through us. It's easier for us to get involved in it. And a life of peace is just characterized by a calm confidence and a sovereign God whose love and wisdom always cause him to do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. And an inestimable amount of damage can be done when we consciously or unconsciously try to move things forward because God isn't moving fast enough. Listen to this. God doesn't appreciate what he doesn't initiate. God is a God of peace. Those of you that are single, listen, it's better to spend five fewer years with the right person than five longer years with the wrong person. Relax. Chill out. Give it over to God. Give him. Understand, in Jesus, there's peace. Second thing I learned, 2015, that you can't outgive God. You cannot outgive God. I, I love what scripture says in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. It says, Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount that you get back. You know what? My parents have always been givers. My father's always been a giver. You know, I'm yet to meet an unhappy giver. You know, my father, he, he, he always gave. He gave of his time. He gave of his money. He gave of his energy. Whatever it was, my dad was a giver. I learned to give through my father, through watching my father. When I first came to the church here, it was nine years ago this month. Hard to believe it's been nine years. When we first came, our church went through some difficult days, and I was a dual member. I was a member here, but I was also a member at Saddleback as well, too. I didn't really sign on the membership thing, but I went every Saturday night at 4.30. And the reason why I was there is because uh, I wasn't really encouraged coming to our church. We were going through difficult days. Our church wasn't the same then as it was here, as it is now. I love going to church now, but it was tough going to those days. I needed encouragement. And one weekend, I heard Pastor Rick get up and talk about giving. And what he said is he said, you can't outgive God. And he talked about this story that whenever he and Kay were young and they were just starting off at Saddleback, that they had always given 10%, but they asked God to stretch them. And he said, so what they started doing is every year they started giving 1% more every single year. So they would increase their giving from 10% to 11% to 12%. And I remember I went home and I told Shannon about this principle and I said, you know what? Let's go for it. My wife's a giver too. I said, let's go for it. So guess what? We did nine years ago. We started giving 1% more each year, 1% more. Why? Because I believe Paul's taught us the secret of being content. You know what the secret of being content is? Desiring less. If you desire less, you can be content. And guess what? I'm yet to meet an unhappy giver. So Shannon and I, we continue to give. We gave to our Imagine program. We've given to Man and Missions. You know what? We, we, we give here to our church because we love our church. And, and we have learned that you cannot outgive God. And 2000 and 14, the lesson that I learned there was you can't outgive God. And I remember we had made a significant investment into our Imagine initiative here at our church. And uh, we, we had we'd, we'd given, we knew this was the amount, and then God called us to, to adoption. So we were going to adopt a baby from the Philippines. And, and then I remember telling Shannon, I was like, well, I don't know if time's going to work out and how much is this going to cost, and we don't have the money to be able to do this. And then guess what? My wife got a job teaching that paid the exact same amount of money that it was gonna cost for us to be able to adopt our child. God completely took care of all that. She signed a one-year contract, guess what? All that money's in the bank, it's all ready to go, we're ready to take our trip, guess what? Because I believe you cannot outgive God. We had another thing happen this past year that as we continue to give, uh, we, we had some significant 
uh, home things that needed to be done to our home. Some things that are like, things you don't see. You know what I mean? Like things that are expensive, but you don't get to like see, wow, that was awesome. But they're things you need. You know what I'm talking about. And guess what? We prayed over those things. And, and uh, man, we went to some people in our church that actually, uh, uh, you know, had a company on that. And, and uh, we said, hey, you know, give us a quote. Man, God blessed us through that situation. And they said, you know what? God put it upon our heart just to give that to you. And I look back and say, you know, only God can do that. That you cannot outgive God. That when you trust God with your money, guess what? He begins to do things that you can never do on your own. Here's the third thing that I learned this past year. Third thing that I learned is saying the best yes. It's important to say the best yes. Because as our church has grown and as I've gotten more involved in things, I, I have just learned this about me. I'm not very good at saying, I'm going to try to get this word out of my mouth, but it's really hard to say. Some of you have a hard time saying this word too. You, you'll be able to relate. Let me see if I can say it. No, hold on. No. 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 <laughs> really hard for that thing to come out of my mouth. Anybody else struggle with saying that word as well? Okay. Yes. I got that down. Perfect. Okay. I'm really good at that one, but saying no. And, and what I've learned this past year is that God wants me to say the best yes. Because every time I say yes to something, I'm simultaneously saying no to something else. And oftentimes that can be my family. Oftentimes that can be my own health. Oftentimes that can be my time with God. Oftentimes that can be my, you know, working out, you know, for, for energy's sake. I mean, man, there's a lot of things that I say yes to. And because I say yes to those things, I cannot do what God has truly called me to be able to do. And so this past year, God has taught me how to say the best yes I got to a place where I was really overwhelmed this past summer. I had way too many commitments. I had said yes to too many things. I was involved in too many boards. I was involved in too many programs. And uh, I was just doing too much. I, have you been there? You're just like, I can't keep doing this. And so uh, I remember praying. And one of the things I talked to a mentor of mine, he was like, do you have an assistant? I was like, uh, yeah, I have lots of assistants. <laughs> He's like, no, do you have somebody that can help you? And guess what? We prayed. God blessed us. Shannon and I prayed together. We were looking through and just praying. God bless us with Benita. Man, God uh, man, brought Benita to our team. And she is an incredible assistant. And Shannon and I love Benita dearly, you know, just to be able to help me to be able to say the best yes. But I also had to learn how to manage it myself as well, too. And I'm still learning this. I'm not good at this, but I'm still learning. But here's a couple things that God taught me. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 says this, one thing I do, focus on this one thing. Wherever you are, be all there. So if you're at your house with your kids, be at your house with your kids. See, oftentimes, I'm not always all there. And it's like, how do I be all there? Focus. Uh, we put together these eight core values of our church a few years ago, and, and one of the core values is focus. I didn't create this one. A couple of our staff members did, because they're a lot better at it than I am. And they know I say yes all the time. And this is good balance for me. And we say it like this. I will be intentional about saying Yes to the best and no to the rest. And we ask ourselves this question. Is this a good thing or is this a God thing? Because there's a difference. So I've had to learn to put some personal guardrails in. And, and I've had to learn, you know, a lot of people, like I'm involved in the Orblin Chamber of Commerce, which I love, which is awesome, which is a great thing. Uh, but also, too, I get pitched every week for an idea for a cross point church. And, oh, let me tell you how this could work. I get pitched by people in our congregation all the time. Hey, if we just did this. I know they see our church as a thousand people that come every week, and it's a great marketing place. But I want to keep the main thing the main thing and ask myself, is this a good thing or is this a God thing? So I've had to learn to say, you know what, that just disagrees with our strategy. So I think we're going to stay away from it right now. I've learned to say this. While my heart wants to say yes, the reality of my commitments and my time and my schedule make this a no. And I'm sorry I can't give that the attention that it deserves. I believe in you, and your cause is wonderful. I just have to say no right now. I'm learning to say the best yes, but I want to stop and tell you one last thing that God's teaching me. It's good to be scheduled. It's good to be a good time manager. It's good to make sure that you, you, you know what you're doing and say yes to the best. But don't overschedule yourself and get yourself so boxed in that you cannot say yes to the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit says, I want you to move here, or I want you to call here, or I want you to talk to this person here, or I want you to stop, and we may need to put the schedule aside just for a moment because I got some ministry for you to do right here. That's still saying the best yes. Those are a few things God's taught me. I'll give you one last bonus. 
Those of you that are getting baptized, if you're getting baptized, you can go ahead and get dismissed right now at this time. Some people are getting baptized, and we're going to celebrate with them here in just a moment. By the way, that would be the best yes that you could ever do, is if you want to get baptized, say, yes, I want to get baptized. Uh, that would be the, the next best step to be able to do. Here's the last thing I'll tell you that God taught me here at our church, that God still answers prayer, and don't give up. Don't stop praying for people. God's still changing lives. This past year, we lost a dear lady in our church, Corrine Allen. Some of you know Corrine. Corrine, she worked in our Cubbies ministry downstairs in Awanas. She was a wonderful woman that took it seriously. Every week she studied for her lesson. Every week she put a smile on those kids' faces downstairs. She personally taught both of my kids in Cubbies through Awana. And as Corrine was down there, she was getting prepared. Actually, it was just a couple days before Awana was starting this past year. Uh, and uh, we got the phone call that she had passed away. One of her very last words that she said, she actually was, uh, she was up helping, and she said that her feet hurt. She had had some surgery just a few weeks before that, and, and one of the ladies said, why don't you just sit down for a while? Why don't you sit down? She said, I can't because I'm getting ready for cubbies. I don't want us. And it wasn't long after that that she passed. She had prayed for her husband 25 plus years to accept Christ. She just kept praying. He would come to Christmas, Easter. That's about it. But every week she would pray. Every week she would pray. Every week she would pray. Often she'd come up to me and say, pray for my husband. Would you pray for my husband? On the connection card, she'd write down, pray for my husband. Pray for my husband. So it's church we did. The week after she passed away, it was just a normal Sunday, and I saw her husband walk across the patio downstairs, and I grabbed him, and he was shaking. And I said, Ron, I just want to pray with you. I want you to know how much we love your wife and how much your wife loved you and how much your wife would be so pleased to know you're at church right now. We prayed together. That week we got together. We began to put her service together, which we held here just a couple months ago. And in my office, he rededicated, prayed, asked Jesus into his heart and his life to be the boss, coach, and CEO of his life. Been here almost every week since then. And I look back and say, God answered a prayer of years and years and years and years. Now, last week, uh, well, he came to me. He came to me and he said, you know what? My wife always put a smile on kids' face. She said he would, she would come home every single week and tell me about these kids in Awanas and Cubbies. And, and she had story after story after story of all these kids. And so we were in a, uh, he's like, I'd like God to use me. So we were in a staff meeting. All of a sudden I was thinking, how can we use Ron? And I got to thinking, you know what? He looks kind of like Santa Claus. How many of you last week got a picture with your kids? This was his very first Christmas without his wife who passed away this year. After the last service, I put my arm around Ron and I said, Ron, how you feel? Tears started flowing down his cheeks and he said, Corrine's dancing in heaven right now. Because every week she got an opportunity to put smiles on kids' faces and now I get to experience what she felt every single week. So thanks for letting me serve, Pastor. Thanks for letting me serve. God is in the business of changing people's hearts and lives. Some of you are praying for somebody that you love dearly. Don't stop praying. Don't give up. One of the greatest, greatest lessons you can ever learn is that God can answer prayer. Even the prayer that you don't think he can answer, God can answer the prayer. Father, we love you and we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for these memory stones that we have. God, these times that we can look back and say, only you could have done that. And God, as we wrap up this last year, and as we ramp up for 2016, God, I pray that you will just speak into our hearts and our lives. God, it's our desire as cross pointers to reach our full redemptive potential in you. So God, let us lean into you this week. God, we got one ear pointed up to heaven. And God, like Samuel, your servant, we're saying, speak, your servant is listening. And God, we look forward to what you have planned for us. God, may we look back this next week and just say thank you for the blessings. And God, may we look ahead and say thank you for the hope that's coming. God, we give you all the praise, the honor, the glory for everything you do in
this and through us. And all God's people said, one of my favorite things that we do right now is baptism. What you're about to see is people's lives that have been transformed and changed by the power of Jesus Christ. And as they get down in this water today, it's a symbol of their old life has passed away. New life has become new. It's the picture of the cross, that Jesus went to the cross, he died, and then he rose again. Today, they're going to go under the water as a picture of the death of their sin, their self, and their stuff, and they're going to be raised up into a new life in Jesus Christ. So let's celebrate what God is doing in their life as we worship, as we sing, and as we see dedications of lives turned over to Jesus.